Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me on R. Kelly Appeal TV. Today, we're going to be going over the final um, reading of the motion um, for Robert Sylvester Kelly's appeal. And we're going to start on 27, and we're going to keep on moving. Um, we're going to start at the area where the first act of racketeering, that's where we're going to go. Number one. So let's get started. One. Racketeering Act One. The government failed to prove Racketeering Act One where insufficient evidence existed to prove that defendant caused Demetrius Smith to pay a public aid employee five hundred dollars to secure identification for Jane Doe number one. Despite blatant strong arming by the government, Smith's testimony was inconsistent and vague about whether defendant was even present during any discussions about paying money to bribe someone for the fraudulent identification. Smith consistently testified that he discussed the prospect of bribing someone to obtain the fake identification with Daryl McDavid. Smith did not obtain any money from the defendant and did not recall discussing it with him although he allowed that he might have. R. 719. Whenever Smith failed to testify precisely as the government wanted, he was refreshed with his prior statements, not because he needed refreshing, but as a clear reminder that if he contradicted himself, he could be charged as a co-conspirator. That type of bullying pervaded Smith's examination and suggested that Smith's testimony may have been pressured by the government. Now, pressure by the government. Of course you're going to say what you are told to say if you are being pressured to have a testimony. And that right there was presented to the jury. And when the jury made their decision to convict him on all counts, they did it off of this information. Let's keep going. That type of bullying pervaded Smith's examination and suggested that Smith's testimony may have been pressured by the government. After the subject matter had been discussed numerous times throughout Smith's testimony, the ASA asked the following on redirect. Q. When you spoke to the group, as you testified on direct examination, when you spoke to the group about acquiring a state ID from the welfare office Aaliyah for money, the defendant was there, right? A. I'm pretty sure. I think so, but I'm not. I'm just not positive. Even if I said it before, I'm just not positive. I just don't see that in my head right now. Not sad. That's where a lot of people contradicted themselves. Even some of the ladies on the docuseries, <clears throat> excuse me, even some of the ladies on the docuseries said the same thing. I'm not sure. I don't know the date. I really don't know the address, um, et cetera, et cetera. This makes no sense. How can you charge someone with 10 years to life if you're not sure? <laughs> it's just so weird. But back to Aaliyah. Not satisfied with that answer, the ASA asked Smith again whether defendant was present when there was any discussion about a bribery. Despite his clear concern of facing legal repercussions for his testimony, Smith declared, I don't remember if Robert was there. If I said he was there before, I'm not changing that story to change the story. I'm just going back and I'm just trying, I don't see it in my head Robert next to me. Dot quote. No rational juror could conclude that this less than convincing testimony provided proof beyond a reasonable doubt that defendant caused Smith to tender money to the public aid officer. Even if the evidence showed that the defendant turned to Smith for assistance in facilitating his marriage to Aaliyah, the offense of bribery requires proof that defendant at least knew of Smith's intent to bribe a public official and facilitated in the bribery in some way. The record is devoid of evidence that defendant knew how Smith obtained the identification or facilitated Smith in obtaining the identification. As far as defendant knew Smith obtained the identification from a friend who worked in the public aid office. Without Smith's unequivocal testimony that defendant was part of the planning process of obtaining the fraudulent identification, the evidence was insufficient to sustain the bribery offense. Hmm. Furthermore, Racketeering Act 1, bribery, lacks both vertical and horizontal relatedness. It was an isolated offense having no connection to the other charged acts or to the purpose of the enterprise itself. Indeed, as discussed, Supra, the record simply fails to show that in 1994 any enterprise existed that had a common purpose of facilitating defendants' sexual desire for minors.
Smith testified at length that he had no idea that defendant was involved in any type of sexual relationship with Aaliyah or any other young women. Smith was certainly part of defendant's close circle of confidants, but the mere identification of a group of people who worked for the defendant is not an enterprise make. Smith did not testify about any other conduct in which he engaged to advance the alleged purpose of the enterprise. Smith's conduct was nothing more than a singular event that bore no connection to the purpose of the enterprise, and which bears no connection to the other racketeering acts. Furthermore, because the act did not occur within 10 years of any other predicate act that was sufficiently proven, the act is time barred. Huh. Racketeering Act 1 was not proved beyond a reasonable doubt. 2. Racketeering Act 2 The government failed to prove Racketeering Act 2, that is, sexual exploitation of Stephanie where it offered insufficient evidence that defendant used, employed, persuaded, induced, or enticed Stephanie to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction. The government contends that on a single occasion prior to her 18th birthday, defendant had sexual relations with Stephanie at his studio in Chicago, Illinois and recorded the episode on a video camera. The government cannot produce the video or the camera on which it was allegedly recorded. To be clear, the defendant is alleged to have recorded a legal and seemingly consensual sex act under the law of the state of Illinois that was only a violation of 18 U.S.C. 2251 because Stephanie was not 18 years of age. To demonstrate that defendant committed sexual exploitation of a child pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 2251, it is not enough for Stephanie to simply allege that defendant recorded sexually explicit conduct. Stephanie offered no testimony that proved that defendant, used, persuaded, induced, enticed or coerced, her into, sexually explicit, conduct. Stephanie had an ongoing sexual relationship with defendant before the video recording incident and after the video recorded incident. Although she described those sexual experiences in hindsight as humiliating, it does not follow that defendant did anything to persuade, induce, entice or coerce her into the sexual activity that was recorded. In fact, Stephanie admits that defendant called her on the phone and told her that he was picking her up and that he wanted to make a video of us having sex and that he would be there shortly. To which Stephanie responded, okay. Although Stephanie clearly regrets this decision, her own testimony shows that defendant did nothing but tell her he wanted to videotape them having sex and she agreed. The government must prove that defendant did something more than just film the sexually explicit conduct. If the act of filming or recording alone was sufficient to sustain the charge, Congress would not have included a requirement that the defendant employ, persuade, indu, entire, or coerce. Furthermore, the government failed to prove that defendant acted with a purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct. Although the jury was erroneously charged that the government could sustain the charge by proving that the purpose was transmitting a visual depiction, the statute requires something different. Indeed, producing is defined by the statute as producing, directing, manufacturing, issuing, publishing, or advertising. 18 U.S.C. 2256 while the statute also prohibits the transmission of live visual depictions, defendant was not charged with transmitting a live visual depiction and there is no evidence that he did. Lastly, the party's stipulation that the film used in VHS tapes was a type of film that was not produced in Illinois is insufficient to prove by a reasonable doubt that the conduct was recorded on a device made in a foreign country or affected interstate commerce. Accordingly, the government failed to prove Racketeering Act 2 by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. 3. Racketeering Act 5 The government failed to prove Racketeering Act 5 where there was insufficient evidence that defendant used a facility of interstate commerce to knowingly persuade, induce, entice, or coerce your Honda to engage in sexual activity that violated Illinois law, and that defendant knowingly committed the prohibited sexual activity. To obtain a conviction under Section 2422, the government must show that the defendant used a facility of interstate commerce to knowingly persuade, induce or entice any individual who is younger than 18 years old to engage in sexual activity of a criminal nature. United States v. Brand, 467 F3D 179, 201
First, the government did not prove that defendant used a facility of interstate commerce to persuade Jerhonda to engage in aggravated criminal sexual abuse between May 2009 and January 2010. Defendant contends that purely interstate use of cell phones does not constitute use of a facility of interstate commerce. United States v. Lopez, 514 U.S. 549. Gonzalez v. Reich, 545 U.S. 1. But see United States v. Giordano, 442 F3D 31, 40 to 41, finding that the jurisdictional element of Section 2425 is satisfied by interstate use of a telephone capable of transmitting communicates between states. Even if purely interstate use of cell phones constituted use of a facility of interstate commerce, the government's evidence that defendant called Jerhonda on a telephone is not sufficient proof that he used the facility of interstate commerce to knowingly, induce, persuade, entice, or coerce Jerhonda to come to Olympia Fields to engage in prohibited sexual activity. The government provided no text exchanges showing that defendant used any words to induce, persuade, entice, or coerce, nor did Jerhonda testify that during any telephone conversation or on any text messages did defendant use words for the purpose of inducing, persuading. And I really believe that right now the government is tweaking cases to produce new law internet law, intrastate law, interstate law, um, international law. I think that what is happening is we need to be mindful of all of the could-be charges that were thrown out here. This may possibly be the new way that the government will be handling internet situations with people underage, people, you know, um, internet rape, you know, it could be, there could be so many new ideas that come from these concepts that they put out here against Robert Sylvester Kelly under this trial here that we must be mindful of. So that's what I wanted to point out. And Tice are coercing her to come to his home or studios for prohibited sexual activities. Under the plain reading of the statute, there must be a nexus between the use of the cell phone and the words of persuasion, enticement, or coercion to satisfy a Section 2422 violation. For example, if defendant called Jerhonda and invited her to a party at his home, and then once there, he coerced her into prohibited sexual activity, that does not constitute a Man Act violation pursuant Section 2422 since the defendant did not use the facility of interstate commerce to coerce or induce her into the prohibited sexual activity. Use of the cell phone for some unknown communication coupled with a subsequent prohibited sex act is not sufficient to establish a violation of Section 2422. Lastly, if defendant really believed that Jerhonda was 17 when they engaged in sexual activity and that belief was reasonable, then he would not be guilty of aggravated criminal sexual abuse. Taking the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, no reasonable juror could conclude that defendant knew that Jerhonda was 16 years old when they allegedly engaged in sexual activity between May 2009 and January 2010. Jerhonda turned 17 years old in April 2010. Government's Exhibit 70 which depicts a photo of Jerhonda would fail to put any reasonable person on notice that she was 16 years old rather than 17 years old. The record reflects that Jerhonda habitually lied about her age. When she was 15 years old, she befriended a 23-year-old woman with whom she would attend defendants' Illinois state court appearances in 2008. To gain access to those court appearances, Jerhonda had to demonstrate that she was 18 years of age, presumably by showing an identification. Hmm. After using her older connections to get invited to a party at defendant's home in Olympia Fields, she sought out the defendant and falsely told him that she was 19 years old. To be clear, there is no evidence that defendant sought out Jerhonda. Jerhonda implausibly claims that after going through all the trouble of lying about her age to get close to defendant and past his security team, she decided to disclose her true age of 16 immediately after their first sexual encounter. Jerhonda claims that defendant was indifferent to her age and continued to engage in sexual relations with her until January 2010. The government's evidence falls painfully short of proving that defendant did not reasonably believe that Jerhonda was 17 years old at the time of their alleged sexual activities.
The government allegedly recovered a copy of Jurhanda's fake ID and birth certificate in a storage facility purportedly belonging to defendant. Rather than reach the obvious conclusion that Jurhanda provided a fake ID to defendant's security team to gain access to the home, the government alleges that defendant or someone in his inner circle went through the trouble of altering her ID and photocopying it. No rational juror could conclude that defendant engaged in sexual activities with Jurhanda with the understanding that she was not of legal consenting age. 4. Racketeering Act 6. No rational juror could conclude based on the evidence adduced at trial that defendant knowingly obtained, or agreed to obtain, any labor or services from Jurhanda on January 23, 2010. A conviction of forced labor under 18 U.S.C. Section 1589 requires the government to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant obtained the labor or services of another person through, inter alia, threats of serious harm, and the defendant acted knowingly. United States v. Marcus, 487 F. Sup. 387, 310E. DNY, 2007. The language, by means of, contained in the Forced Labor Statute, 18 U.S.C. § 1589, requires the government to establish a causal link between the labor and services provided by the person and the threat of, serious harm. ID, serious harm, for purposes of § 1589 is defined as, NY harm, whether physical or non-physical, including psychological, financial or reputational harm, that is sufficiently serious, under all the surrounding circumstances. To compel a reasonable person of the same background and in the same circumstances to perform or to continue to performing labor or service in order to avoid incurring that harm. Machira vs. Al-Rawaf, 850 F3D 605, 618. Section 1589 is intended to address serious trafficking, or cases where traffickers threaten harm to third persons, restrain their victims without physical violence or injury, or threaten dire consequences by means other than overt violence. ID. The harm or threat of harm, considered from the vantage point of a reasonable person in the place of the victim, must be sufficiently serious to compel that person to remain in her condition of servitude when she otherwise would have left. ID. Part of a fair reading of statutory text is recognizing that Congress legislates against the backdrop of certain unexpressed presumptions. United States v. Toviev, 761 F3D 623, 628 Section 1589, the forced labor statute, was passed to implement the 13th Amendments Against Slavery or Involuntary Servitude. United States v. Toviev, 761 F3D 623, 629. I believe this is where they are trying to say that he had sex slaves and he had people who were uh, human trafficking. Uh, that, that, this, this case right here is connected to that. So if you remember hearing about sex slaves or if you remember hearing that they were locked in the basement and did this and that, they got that from this case right here. United States v. Toviev, 761 F3D 623, 629. Congress intended to reach cases in which persons are held in a condition of servitude through nonviolent coercion, as well as through physical or legal coercion. Machira, 850 F3D at 617. According to the government, on an isolated date in January 2010, defendant violated the forced labor statute by using threats of violence to obtain labor, an act of oral sex, from Jurhanda. The forced labor statute was not intended to reach isolated conduct like that described by Jurhanda. Accepting the government's evidence in its best light, Jurhanda described an isolated incident in which the defendant allegedly assaulted her because he was angry that she was on her phone and did not properly acknowledge him when he entered the room. Jurhanda claimed that defendant slapped and choked her because he didn't believe that I was texting a friend and he got mad about it. Jurhanda testified that after the purported assault, she sat down with defendant in the VIP room and he instructed her to perform oral sex on him. Jurhanda complied with the instruction. Jurhanda did not testify that defendant threatened her, forced her, or even demanded that she give him oral sex. Jurhanda did not claim that she feared defendant would assault her again if she declined the request. Jurhanda then left defendant's home and never came back. The government did not establish a causal link between the isolated act of oral sex and any threat of physical violence.
Any physical violence that occurred during that episode in January 2010 preceded Jerhonda providing oral sex to defendant. Jerhonda's testimony simply does not lead to the reasonable inference that she gave defendant oral sex because she feared physical violence. Jerhonda did not claim that defendant used any words suggesting she would suffer an assault if she did not provide him with oral sex nor did she claim that she feared another assault if she refused his request for oral sex. Jerhonda did not even testify that she did not want to give defendant oral sex. As troubling as Jerhonda's story may be, the government still must prove the elements of the crime of forced labor by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It would not have taken much for Jerhonda to make the causal link between the act of oral sex and her fear of physical assault by the defendant. But she simply did not provide the testimony. Hmm. Absent, clear expression of congressional intent, courts should resist the urge to transform the forced labor statute to cover the circumstances alleged in Racketeering Act 6 which bear virtually no resemblance to those paradigmatic forced labor cases and their victims. C. Toviev, 761 F3D 623, 626 Jerhonda came and went as she pleased, even if defendant prohibited her from wandering his property at will. Defendant did not force Jerhonda into a condition of servitude through threats of physical force and an isolated example of oral sex with an alleged abusive act is just not forced labor. 5. Racketeering Act 7 the government failed to prove Racketeering Act 7, that is, sexual exploitation of Jerhonda. According to Jerhonda, during her six-month sexual relationship with the defendant, he recorded her with a Canon video camera and on an iPhone. The government produced no images or metadata corroborating this claim. Rather, the government contends that evidence that defendant owned a Canon video camera and had an iPhone that had the ability to video is sufficient evidence to establish the elements of the offense simply amazing so if you have something <clears throat> anything a scanner printer you could be accused of sexual exploitation through video photography wow the government produced no images or metadata corroborating this claim Rather, the government contends that evidence that defendant owned a Canon video camera and had an iPhone that had the ability to video is sufficient evidence to establish the elements of the offense. The government failed to prove that defendant used, employed, persuaded, induced, or enticed Jerhonda to take part in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing a visual depiction. To demonstrate that defendant committed sexual exploitation of a child pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 2251, it is not enough for Jerhonda to simply allege that defendant recorded sexually explicit conduct. Jerhonda's testimony was insufficient to prove that defendant used, persuaded, induced, enticed or coerced her into sexually explicit conduct. According to Jerhonda, she had an ongoing sexual relationship with defendant before defendant allegedly video recorded here, a relationship that defendant would have no reason to believe was prohibited since Jerhonda misrepresented her age. Mm -hmm. Although Jerhonda describes those sexual experiences in hindsight as humiliating, it does not follow that defendant did anything to persuade, induce, entice or coerce her into the sexual activity that was recorded. The government must prove that defendant did something more than just film the sexually explicit conduct. If the act of filming or recording alone was sufficient to sustain the charge, Congress would not have included a requirement that the defendant employ, persuade, indu, entire, or coerce. Furthermore, the government failed to prove that defendant acted with a purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct. Although the jury was erroneously charged that the government could sustain the charge by proving that the purpose was transmitting a visual depiction, the statute requires something different. Indeed, producing is defined by the statute as producing, directing, manufacturing, issuing, publishing, or advertising. 18 U.S.C. 2256 while the statute also prohibits the transmission of live visual depictions, defendant was not charged with transmitting a live visual depiction and there is no evidence that he did. Lastly, the government's affecting interstate commerce evidence was insufficient where it could not establish what device, if any, was used to make these recordings. So we're only on page 37, 6 of Racketeering Act 8, the Man Act violations with Jane. So we're already at 24 minutes. I'd like to keep these very 
um, um, limited videos so you can get it all in one sitting. So we will record the rest on uh, next Sunday. Sorry about the scratchy throat. I have no idea what's going on. But um, anyway, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings about this? Being Having a video camera is like me having a microphone in my studio with recording audio um, visuals to put my videos together. So is that a corruption that could cause a conviction of some sort in an act that I choose to do if I say um, exploit someone's name or character on on the internet. I mean, this is interstate. This is interstate, the internet. So, wow, these laws are beginning to pin themselves on the future of technology. And we have to be very careful with that. And R. Kelly, Robert Sylvester Kelly on the Gail King um, interview warned us of what social media can do. So I believe that this is the, the preceding um, authority on the laws that are gonna be transferred from the physical world to the internet world. What are your views on that? Um, yeah, and the lies that were told, you know, with Aaliyah's uh, um, I, f fake ID and then Geronda's fake ID. I mean, how do these girls get these fake IDs? And that's something that a lot of people may insinuate that R. Kelly had the power to do. Um, but it still won't stand up because of the fact that they have no proof that it was done by him per se or his entourage. So... <laughs> I think attorney Jennifer Bonjean has done a phenomenal job so far and we're only on page 37. Tomorrow, our next Sunday, we will be looking at Racketeering Act 8, the Man Act Violation with Jane. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, subscribing, and being a part of this podcast um, for the motion review of Robert Sylvester Kelly, according to attorney on Jean's motion. So I thank you so much. God bless you. And we'll see you next Sunday.